somebody in the CryptoPunks community um, last week, a couple weeks back, he he purchased a CryptoPunk and then, um, you know, basically said, hey, we should all get together. I'm in New York and 50 plus people got together. It was pretty wild. Like, I, I don't think a mechanic like that kind of existed 10 years ago um, where people are kind of bound together by like a loose common purpose. In that instance, it was a CryptoPunk um, and you get to meet people and it kind of adds a social layer part of it. It's just super fascinating. And it's not that dissimilar around squiggles, you know, so many people, uh, if they have the means and the time and the opportunity, they'll migrate down to Marfa. I know that's when we first met Nifty and yep. it's, it's, a spe- it's a special moment. The Squiggle Dow podcast is brought to you by Niftify. If you need liquidity, instead of selling your NFT, you can get a loan. Niftify is the most battle-tested and secure NFT lending protocol. You can borrow ETH, USDC or DAI from lenders using your NFTs as collateral in a trustless peer-to-peer fashion. By being peer-to-peer, you can get better terms on specific or rare NFTs. And there is no liquidation risk, as long as you repay the loan before maturity, your NFT is yours. Head over to niftify.com and access the app today. Welcome to the Squiggle DAO podcast. I'm Nifty. I lead finance, acquisitions, and NFT DeFi for the DAO. Today, I'm missing my co-host Jared, but he should be back soon. Our guest today is Aaron Wright. Aaron is the co-founder of Tribute Labs, a company that creates and supports DAOs, such as the Lao, Flamingo, and Neon. The impact of Tribute DAOs speaks volumes, with nearly 90,000 ETH raised, equivalent to $200 million at today's prices. They've collected over 22,000 NFTs, and invested in almost 700 projects. Beyond his groundbreaking work in the blockchain space, Aaron is also a published author and a respected law professor, bringing a unique blend of academic insight and real-world experience to his endeavors. It's truly an honor to have him with us today. Aaron, welcome to the pod. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Of course. And when one, one of the things that uh, stand out in your background is your background and career are impressive, but one of the things that first came to to our top of the list of questions we want to talk to you about was the your role in the creation of Ethereum. What was your role and what was your experience there? Um, I was just fortunate enough to uh, find digital assets pretty early on and, and follow lots of the uh, interesting kind of threads and ways that people wanted to extend Bitcoin. And uh, when Ethereum uh, was announced, I reached out to the team and just helped them out in in different ways uh, early on, uh, and also was fortunate enough to help out a lot of the early projects that uh, kind of um, began to grow out of the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, so it was just helping uh, a bit with the, the launch and, and obviously helping uh, a bit with some of the early projects that were kind of growing out of this ecosystem um, and all the, the, at the time, which seemed like a bit crazy ideas, uh, kind of watching them kind of come to life. So that, that's been a, that's been my role. I've always just tried to be helpful and supportive of this great ecosystem. That's incredible. And you mentioned in the past that you got into Bitcoin incredibly early, like 2011. How did you discover Bitcoin so early and what was the landscape at that time? So I, I graduated from law school and began to uh, play around with user-generated content um, and uh, became kind of enamored with wikis and you know this was when wikipedia was a much much smaller project and had the the impact that it, it has today um and really with a fortunate twist of, of fate um i began to just with a couple other people hack away at media wiki which was the underlying open source software um, and just became enamored with open source technology uh, off the bat and you know, bitcoin was a very uh, important and growing open source projects. So I kind of kept tabs on lots of the cool, interesting open source projects that were bubbling up in, um, you know, from that time. And obviously Bitcoin kind of hit my radar because of it. I have a background in law, history, and economics. And, you know, not surprisingly, thinking about digital assets or Bitcoin, it, it kind of hit me in a lot of my sweet spots. So it jumped out to me, I think maybe a little bit more more so than it would for other people. And because 2011, we are talking at the, the era where it was possible to mine Bitcoin on on your personal laptop, right? Uh, yep. For some folks, that's that's what they were doing. Yeah, I mean, it was it was very different. I think you know, it was not it was viewed as not something that would succeed, right? It was much more of like a toy or like a, a hobbyist type endeavor. And you know, I think quickly 
uh, from that, it kind of blossomed into an entire ecosystem uh, and attracted all this attention and developer activity, which is which has just been really fun to watch. I think the one thing that I've just seen with digital assets and just blockchain technology off the bat, uh, it's always kind of exceeded expectations. You know, folks in the ecosystem come up with these really interesting ideas and they just seem to come to life. Um, and that's just what's been kind of fascinating to watch uh, from my vantage point. I, I don't think I've seen other technology develop in, in much the same way. And I think that's just a testament to the open source and kind of open, um, open nature uh, of these ecosystems. I totally agree with the exit expectations and also they become a reality or a success faster than anyone can imagine. Like we, we saw that with crypto, but also NFTs and, and different projects. So it's incredible. And we've mentioned 2011, discovering and getting into Bitcoin, helping in the creation of Ethereum. And also you get got interested in DAOs really early. What got you interested into the DAO space? Yeah, so, you know, the conversation around DAOs really started starting in about 2013. People began to look at Bitcoin and, and look at digital assets and, and began to think, hey, like, it's really amazing that we can, in a matter of minutes, send value anywhere across the globe. But what happens if we are able to send other forms of value? And so there's early projects like Color Coins, uh, which came out of um, some folks um, that were early in the Bitcoin ecosystem that began to think about, hey, Uh, how about we just color a part of a, a Bitcoin, a, like a SAT, um, and and transfer that? And we can say, hey, this this represents, a, let's say, just a share in a company of some sort. And so um, folks like Dan Larimer came up with this notion of, of a, a decentralized autonomous corporation or a DAC. And then that idea became generalized when people realized, well, we don't just need to you know, have existing legacy entities like corporations, we can have more open permissionless uh, organizations and we'll call them DAOs. And then they began to kind of map out the idea space related to it. Uh, so that that kind of core idea was something that animated many of the folks that uh, were pretty early on in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, and I was fortunate enough at uh, a project that we called Open Law to begin to explore it. Uh, so a lot of very early Bitcoin slash Ethereum conferences, people were beginning to ask questions about, well, hey, how can we have internet native organizations? And if we do, how can they interact with stuff in the real world? Um, and these types of questions I just thought were completely fascinating and kept on diving into it. And at OpenLaw, we kind of operated like a research and development type group uh, where we were just kind of blue skying and trying to develop a whole bunch of interesting ideas and concepts around blockchains. So we were playing around with things like real-time payments, real-time tax collection. We were playing around with trying to represent financial instruments in a, in a way that would work with the legacy world. Um, and we were also playing around with um, concepts like DAOs and concepts like online arbitration systems. So all these types of early ideas that people were talking about in message boards, we were taking some early first swipes to, um, to you know, bring them into reality. It was all very rough. But I think we were able to kind of map out a bit of the, the idea space and kind of related to that, just because it is the Squiggled Out podcast. We were also doing quite a bit around NFTs and how do we represent media? How do we represent rights to media in kind of these digital, digital native formats? I think we were one of the first, if not the, the first, if not one of the first teams to explore things like fractionalized NFTs, even though I don't know if they work in practice. It was definitely like an interesting concept uh, to begin to think through. It was definitely from like a research posture. Yeah. So, super interesting. I wasn't aware that DAOs were already a, a topic in before Ethereum and in, in Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, and that's why if you go back and read the, the Vital Vitalik's white paper, he starts talking about them. You know, and I, I think that there's just like a shape um, to them. You know, there's there's uh, parts of DAOs that are much more about participatory. How do we make flatter organizations that people can vote in? And then I think there was kind of more at the time, like blue sky ideas about how do we make fully auto automated DAOs or autonomous DAOs. And I think with all the advancements we're seeing in other parts of the tech ecosystem, like AI, that, that vision is coming kind of closer to reality. But that's what people were thinking about. I love it. And, and I totally think it's the future of work. One, I've counted, if I've counted correctly, I think Tribute Labs has created 19 DAOs so far. What are some challenges that you see running DAOs currently? 
Yeah, I mean, there's lots of challenges. I mean, I think that there's many, many things that an organization needs to operate effectively. Um, and those things just take time to kind of build the tech and tooling and, and automation uh, related workflows in order to make those organizations run effectively. And that's kind of the core uh, task that we're taking on uh, at Tribute Labs. How do we smooth, smooth out all these operational bits so that people have information, can make decisions, can vote, can keep track of things that they may have uh, purchased or things that they want to do together if it, it comes down to investments. Um, it's really kind of like the back of the house. Like how do you automate all those different bits so that people in the front of the house, uh, the decision makers can can make all those decisions. Uh, and there's lots of challenges related to that. Um, you know, when you're dealing with groups that are operating a little bit more at arm's length, uh, attention, I'm sure you feel this in squiggle Dow, Nifty, um, you know, attention ebbs and flows. Uh, it's hard to get people to want to make make decisions. It's hard to convene people, um, especially if they're not necessarily in the same room or the same uh, country. So I think there's lots of kind of like governance, what I call like governance scaling questions where we just don't know the right way to do it. We don't have the right tools at our disposal yet, uh, but they're fun problems to kind of work on. Um, so those are definitely like some of the challenges, but to me, it's much more the opportunity, you know, the vision of having disparate people uh, all across the globe that are interested in a shared idea, a shared project, a shared concept, a shared media object working together, um, you know, I just think is just, beautiful. Um, and it's great to see different groups of people come together um, and build stuff that's productive for, you know, society, as opposed to just getting together to like, you know, trash somebody on Twitter or, or X now, uh, or, you know, or do something that's a little bit, uh, I'd say like more, um, you know, not as not as positive. So that's, that's really the vision that I think uh, really keeps us going at, at Tribute. And, and obviously this vision of kind of pushing DAOs towards things that are fully automated, I, I think it's a big problem and, and one that we, we hopefully can uh, can make some good efforts to, to solve. And what you were talking about, that if you can coordinate a, a group of diverse individuals with different backgrounds towards the same goal, I, I was researching Tribute DAOs. I was thinking, is the future or they are revolutionizing the landscape of venture capital funds? You can raise capital faster than any VC. I, I was listening to all the interviews, you, and you are mentioning that Neptune raised $35 million in an hour. That's something that would take months for, for a traditional fund. And, and you can invest uh, in a way that is much more agile. Like I, I remember the, the story of the punk that people were coordinating in, in a Friday night in, in a few hours to, to raise $750,000 to buy the Purple Hat Punk, Alien Punk. So uh, I think it's the future of, of BCs. And I think uh, also that you are identifying projects earlier than, than BC and crypto funds. So it's incredible. But one thing that I guess, or I haven't seen the answer yet, is the liquidity problem. I, I We have some of the conversations already. What's the liquidity event for, for DAO members? Have you thought about that problem? I guess, but do you have solutions for that problem? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's definitely something that we've uh, been thinking through. You know, all of our DAOs uh, are pretty small. So the way I, I kind of view, how do you solve these governance challenges? It's a bit like a computer. Um, I think a lot of folks set up DAOs and they wanted to build supercomputers. They wanted tens of thousands of people to participate or thousands of people to participate and it's great. And I think long-term that's where we're gonna get, we're gonna go. Um, but I think our approach was why don't we start with like a, why don't we start a little bit smaller? Um, why don't we uh, cap these at under a hundred folks to start? Uh, why don't we make sure that we, you know, the, the real people, um, not necessarily just synonymous actors. They can participate in the DAO synonymously, but at least we know that they're the real people, that they're well-intentioned and kind of what they want to do. And why don't we just try to start to map out um, um, map out these approaches? And our approach, you know, for, uh, for better um, and sometimes worse is a little bit more like Coinbase's. Like we're going to take this step-by-step step to kind of map out this space and, and try to do so in a, in a reasonable and prudent way. Um, and along with that, you know, we do not have a, uh, on, any, on any of these DAOs a freely tradable asset. Um, I'd love to get to the point where we can experiment with that. Uh, I think there's some regulatory challenges, at least here in the States where we are, um, sorting that out. 
Um, along with just actually just think like community governance questions. I think when you have kind of a liquid asset, it, it creates another set of problems that I think folks need to kind of sort through the right way to approach it. Um, the DAOs themselves, they're entirely in member managed. So the members decide, you know, if and when and how they want liquidity. Um, you know, that could include if there's proceeds from an investment, distributing that. It could include, you know, them deciding to sell it. Um, and it can also include them kind of trading in a more uh, OTC way, their interest to another party that the members want to let in. So that's at this point kind of how we've addressed it. I think over time, and hopefully as like the regulatory landscape improves, hopefully as um, you know, governance questions kind of become clearer uh, to make sure that, that these communities stay healthy, uh, we'll begin to kind of tackle those problems too. So it's, it's definitely an issue. You know, these things, and at least our setup of DAOs is far from perfect, but um, our, our approach is really just trying to make a good faith effort to, to tackle it kind of step by step. We look forward or we look at really with a lot of respect and, and admiration to all the Tribble Labs in, in one of the the ones that we admire and, and we pay closest attention to is Flamingo. And how do you see Flamingo going forward? Do you see maybe potential for expansion into other chains or what's the future of Flamingo? Uh, the future of Flamingo is really up to the members. I mean, uh, Flamingo started the genesis of flamingo came from our kind of our first DAO, the Lao. Um, you know, this is one of the benefits I think of kind of a an a DAO like approach. Uh, lots of different people with lots of different backgrounds got together. They had different interests. Um, and at the time, you know, it wasn't really clear that digital media, NFTs, digital art would kind of break out as a category. But in the Lao, because it had a pretty broad set of decision makers, there was a group of people in there, myself included, that thought that this was going to be a pretty big opportunity space and a great way to support creators, a great way to, you know, kind of build a future that was more inclusive, uh, a great way to, um, you know, reward and compensate uh, and support uh, amazing artists. So all these kind of ideas were were floating floating around, um, but a lot of people didn't didn't see that, and so Flamingo kind of served as an early beacon for people that were interested in NFTs, in digital art, um, and increasingly, and pretty early on, generative art uh, to kind of get together, to map out the space, to understand who the best creators are, to kind of obsess over uh, different traits, things that I think you guys do quite well in Squiggled Out too. Um, all those types of conversations started pretty early. Um, you know, Flamingo is entirely member directed, so it's really what the members want, want to do. Um, and I think that that gives the organization some flexibility to expand in different in, in different ways in the future um, and to grow. And I think that's what's one of the nice things about DAOs is that they, they really have like an open, open-ended open mantle um, and a lot of flexibility in ways that they could, could grow in the future. So I think, you know, right now, Flamingo is focused on what it, um, what it does best. And I'm saying this as kind of a, a individually as a member of Flamingo, which is just finding the best creators that it can, that there's broad consensus are super talented and giving them the support that they that they need. Um, and really just trying to make sure that those creators, you know, have a spotlight on them so that they can continue to, to generate and create great works. So obviously we've been big fans of, of, uh, of Squiggles. So uh, we're obviously uh, very hopeful that the Squiggle ecosystem continues to grow and all the great people that are collectors and, uh, and all the great people that not only collect squiggles, but support gender of art. We obviously want to continue to support those guys or, or all you guys too. And and before we get into squiggles a little bit more, is that the way that new DAOs are created? Like in an organic process where a DAO gets a, a site interest and it grows to a point where a new DAO needs to be created? Or what's the process? Yeah, the, the process is also pretty organic. Usually one or more members of a of an existing DAO just kind of say, hey, I think there's something here. Um, and there's an ongoing discussion about, hey, uh, should we start something else to look at this category? Uh, it could be a tech category, it could be an art and media category. Um, and what's nice about kind of the collaborative approach, uh, folks that are interested in that specific thesis or that specific idea or that specific subcategory can, can find other people that are interested in it. Um, and usually at that point, um, people uh, identify other folks in their network and, and they hop along too. 
So it has a lot of flexibility to kind of uh, expand like a network uh, of folks, but to do so in a pretty controlled way and in a pretty curated way as well. And that's something I we where I learned uh, as being part of the early wiki communities where we set up online communities of people that wanted to write and create uh, content together. Um, and the way that we approached at this company I used to be at called Wikia um, was was really that. We would look to see if there was a cluster of people that wanted to work together. And if so, um, we, we would support them at Wikia with tooling and, and other things that they needed to, to do what they wanted to do. So it's a much more like support type of function from our vantage point. Um, and very directed by our users, which I think is an, a nice thing and, an, and the right way to approach it. Makes makes sense, the bottom-up approach, totally. And going back to, to Flamingo, one of the largest squiggle holders and, and supporters, how did you as a group recognize the potential of squiggles uh, uh, so early and make the decision to allocate a significant portion of your portfolio? Um, you know, at the time, it really is just passion directed. You know, I one member of the DAO was poking around a bunch of early NFT projects and art blocks really stood out. I think uh, for folks that may not uh, have been around uh, art blocks early, it was not, it wasn't the same. Um, and it was very mellow. Um, there was a handful of folks that thought it was interesting. Uh, the artwork that was getting created from it was interesting. Um, the, the mechanics of minting, which was still new for many people, was interesting. The idea that <clears throat> that art or uh, some sort of media could be put into a network set was kind of novel and interesting. Um, and these types of concepts just really jumped out to a bunch of folks in the DAO. Uh, so most, uh, you know, most things that Flamingo will collect, it starts with one person saying something to the effect of, hey, this is interesting. Does anybody check this out? And then somebody else will check it out and, and poke around and they'll say, oh yeah, this is pretty cool. We should we should dig in a little bit more. Or, oh, did you check out this work, et cetera. So it starts really like organically, but since there's a pretty broad group of decision makers, um, you can kind of tell when there's excitement around a project. And Artblocks was one of the, the early examples inside of Flamingo of a project that people, uh, a, a large group of people were excited about. Um, and as they got excited about it, they wanted to collect together um, and build a collection of the great early works that were coming out on our blocks. Uh, so this was really right around the time Genesis w was released. Uh, so I think Genesis minted out, um, but a lot of the early sets in you know, season one and season two, uh, folks were, were super geeked about. Um, and they wanted to kind of collect that together and give those artists uh, support. I think the other thing that jumped out <clears throat> around our, our blocks is that it really used a blockchain for um, you know, some of the unique technical characteristics of a blockchain um, as part of its process, right? Um, and at the time, there wasn't that many folks that were playing around with that and doing so at such a high level. Uh, so it seemed like a, you know, uh, a really great way to kind of support the technology, which many folks in the DAO care deeply about, to support the creators that you know, were toiling away um, with p5.js or some comparable language, um, you know, and weren't getting the recognition that, that they were, that we believe that they should receive given the cre creativity that they were showing to the world. So I think that it was kind of that combination that, that uh, really led to people's early excitement around generative art period. And obviously Squiggles just kind of became a rallying call for many folks that were interested in the space. Uh, I think, you know, it, the fact that it was put together, you know, by Eric, who had, had built one of the early and I think it's, you know, still the leading generative art platform, um, just made it something that people wanted to collect. But I, I remember kind of watching someone put together like an art box minting like bot and just like kind of watching it from the corner of my eye while I was scrolling around, um, like around Twitter and just seeing kind of the fundings that were coming out of it. People would be like, oh, there's a bold or, you know, there's a fuzzy. I can't believe that. That's a new one. So it's it's kind of fun. I think those like kind of fun uh, minting mechanics are are really what makes art blocks and generative art pretty special. A hundred percent. I think it's the perfect match. Like the minting mechanics for generative art and and blockchain makes makes total sense. And what you were saying, like the power of this is the clear example of the power of DAOs when where you put the hive mind of smart people in a room. That's where 
recognize those those types of opportunities early and those kinds of magic things happen. Yeah, and it's not perfect, right? So it's just, I think it like you, it able, it, what we found is that it's able to kind of cut through some noise a little bit better than others. So if you are interested in it, you're able to quickly validate that other folks may be interested in it, which is, which is nice. It's a nice feeling, uh, especially if you're like assessing media or something that you want to collect. It's like a quick way to get a pulse on, hey, do you also find this interesting? And people kind of chirp back to you with an answer, which is kind of nice. At the same time, you see things that people are getting very excited about. And we saw this, you know, during the, the crazy bull run. And what was interesting is inside Flamingo, not that many folks would be interested in it. Um, so you kind of get the negative signal too. So it's not perfect in that regard, but it is a little bit of breaks on some of the FOMO that I think takes hold in, in digital asset markets too. So uh, it's an interesting dynamic between between like validation and also like kind of a little bit of breaks on, on otherwise, uh, on, you know, otherwise things that maybe you shouldn't participate in or maybe not, maybe it you know, doesn't have the value or it doesn't have the, the creative might that you may have thought of, thought of initially. Uh, I think the other thing that's nice is that you're around a whole bunch of folks that are super into the same thing that you are. So uh, on a weekly basis, the folks in Flamingo get together on calls and just chat for like an hour and a half about, a whole bunch of random things. Um, and I think it's nice to kind of work together to like develop a perspective of, of kind of the market, a perspective of which creators are breaking out. Um, that kind of like structured discourse I think is, is lacking. Um, and it's nice to have like a, a space to do that. So I think a lot, of, a lot of members appreciate that too. Totally agree. The community aspect is is key and, and something really relevant that we are leaving it as well in, in the Squiggle DAO community. So I 100% agree. And where, another difficult question, where do you see the, the future of GenArt in general and the Squiggle in particular? Yeah, so I don't really, I, I mean, I think uh, on GenArt, I think it's a huge category. So in part, I'm personally excited about generative art because you have um, a wide range of people uh, that have been trying to use uh, code to kind of express themselves creatively for years. You know, this is something that um, has has not been like a flash in the pan, but a movement that's been building up for decades. Um, you know, from some of the earliest computer art to today, and I think uh, I think that's here to stay. You know, if I think about what represents today's time, uh, I think the idea that a computer or some sort of electronic system would generate that it just feels invariably true. Like it doesn't feel like we live just in an era of canvas and paint. We live in a dynamic era where increasingly our lives are intermediated by computers. And of course, we're going to want to express ourselves that way too. So I think in the long run, generative art is just starting. And I think what, we're, what we kind of saw was the first wave, the early creators that have played around with certain mechanics, primitives or approaches, and that's just going to get refined and refined and refined till we see things that are just absolutely Mind, mind blowing, visually, creatively, et cetera. Uh, and I think we're starting to see that, right? You know, a lot of the early works were pretty static. We're seeing some of the talented developers push to more dynamic works, more rich works, more complex works, you know, and I, I think that's super fascinating. Um, and I think that's gonna, gonna continue. Um, I think, you know, for uh, Squiggles and like other uh, sets, I think the other super interesting aspect is that they're networked, right? It's not just collecting something uh, that you could display in your home, that you could display in a building, that you could display in like a million different formats. It's also that you're joining the community part of it. And I think that that is novel. You know, um, you, you kind of are able to purchase something that you may cherish and love, but at the same time, it's kind of like a, a way to connect with other collectors almost instantaneously. And that is just incredibly powerful. Um, and I think that, that that squiggles really show that more than anything else. Um, it's just such a powerful community of people that love, you know, this pocket of the art world. Um, and it's exciting to kind of see that grow and strengthen. Um, and it's a, a group of great people, at least the folks that I've met. I'm sure not everybody is, is perfectly great, but, you know, I'm, the disproportionate number of folks that are uh, that have collected these items that I've at least had the pleasure of meeting are, you know, just really nice people, super interesting people. Uh, and I think the strength of that community uh, will mean that we'll be talking about squirrels for quite some time. We, we are, yeah, we are really lucky to have 
a great community. It's it's incredible the, the Squiggle community, and that uh, I was talking to someone today, and they they were asking me about the what were what could be the risks or worst case scenarios for these projects, and I was saying more than worst case scenarios. I'm thinking on which ones are going to be relevant in long term, and it's not the earliest. It's going to be the ones that started a movement and have a network behind them, and that's why I always go back to banks and squiggles because. Banks started the whole movement and Squiggles started the R blocks, which is the gold standard of, of blockchain on generative minting. So that's why I go to those two with what you were mentioning of the power of community network supporting supporting them. So that's why it, for me, those two are a no-brainer. Yeah, I mean, they're, super, they're really interesting objects. You know, uh, somebody in the CryptoPunks community um, last week, a uh, couple weeks back, he pur- he purchased a CryptoPunk and then, um, you know, basically said, hey, we should all get together. I'm in New York. And 50 plus people got together. So it was pretty wild. Like, I, I don't think a mechanic like that kind of existed 10 years ago um, where people are kind of bound together by like a loose common purpose. And that instance, it was a CryptoPunk. Um, and you get to meet people and it kind of adds a social layer part of it. It's a super fascinating. And it's not that dissimilar around squiggles. You know, so many people, uh, if they have the means and the time and the opportunity, they'll migrate down to Marfa. I know that's when we first met Nifty. And yep. it's it's a, spe- it's a special moment. Um, and I think, you know, as we feel the internet kind of atomize our lives, it's nice to have something that can cohere it a little bit. Um, and it's nice to be able to cohere around something that, that isn't just like a, politics or you know technology just something that's that's fun right and and hopefully visually appealing and you know pushing culture forward i just think all that stuff's just magical so and the other thing i love about gender of art is it's pushing the art world you know you know i think the art world um and i look at uh, i'm fortunate enough to live in, in in new york and i'm able to go uh to see some of the cultural institutions here and they just don't speak to me the same way that uh, this, this stuff online does. And so it's nice to see uh, online groups really push forward culture, push forward aesthetics, push forward, you know, all these different things that are important. Um, and so uh, I, I love the generative art community for doing that. A hundred percent. And and one thing I, I wanted to emphasize was that the, the power of buying a punk and meeting a group of people with such an, in, an interesting or, or the best backgrounds, the caliber of people that you are going to meet in squiggles or in punks, uh, 99% it's those people are special. It's no not a coincidence that someone ends up owning one of these assets and that doesn't happen with any other object or asset in real life. Completely. So, I, you know, and I think a little bit, it's kind of like, that happens to a certain degree with some other assets too, like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. In many ways, they are communities, right? And they were just interested in, in the case of Bitcoin, some really novel blockchain technology. In Ethereum, it was kind of extending out that novel technology and kind of pushing the envelope a little bit more. So it, it's it's been fun to watch if you take a step up, just like the internet kind of give tools for people to kind of organize around interests and around things that they're they're passionate about. So I hope to see more of that. Snowflow is, is part of Flamingo, after talking a bit about squiggles. And what was there a specific moment that, that comes to mind where you realized he was something special, someone special? Yeah, I mean, so I think that we we were some of the first people, and there's many folks now, that realized that Orplox is a special project. Uh, and so in a couple of the DAOs, um, we were able to support Orplox Um well, I'm also a member of a DAO called Allow. And so, again, this is me, my personal capacity. And as a member of that DAO, we were able to support uh, Art Blocks. Um, you know, we saw a lot of interest and excitement uh, around the project. And we realized that they were running into technical issues. So early on, you know, um, Eric and the, and the, I think it was just Eric at the time, maybe and, uh, Jeff also working on it a little bit. Uh, they had a hard time keeping the site up, right? Um, there's a lot of compute, a lot of complex tech that's that's sitting underneath the hood of our blocks, and and it looked like they needed a bit of support, and so we reached out to 
to Eric, uh, number one, because he had an amazing CryptoPunks collection and some, some members of Flamingo were interested in seeing if he'd be willing to part with one. Um, and number two, you know, because we knew that um, Artblocks was special and, and they need some support. And so we were fortunate enough uh, to be able to just provide a helping hand there uh, to help get, get, you know, get a, a project that looked like it had a lot of potential and, and make sure that it was on more stable footing. Uh, so felt very fortunate uh, to meet to meet Eric, to be able to support him um, and the rest of the team there from from the early days. Um, and I think, you know, I think Eric is a, a special person. I think he has kind of like the right uh, tone and kind of like the right approach to building a community, to building a company, uh, to kind of pushing forward things res responsibly. Um, and that just really resonates with just my my personal affect. An approach, you know, I think we, you know, at Tribute and I think also at Artblocks, we want to make the blockchain ecosystem uh, something that really is um, the envy of the world uh, and also uh, just be supportive and, and shine a spotlight on, on groups or people or, or creators that are uh, not getting the attention we believe that they, they deserve. So I think Eric's super special. He's been special in the punks community. He's been special in the Artblocks community. Whatever he decides to do, I have a feeling he'll be special there. And I and I always like the fact that he kind of came outside of these like bubbles that happen in San Francisco or in traditional tech or or even like uh or even like New York. I think he kind of brings a different energy, which is refreshing. And, and you were mentioning one of, incredible collection of punks. And for those who who don't know, Snowfro was the biggest claimer of zombies when punks were not not minting were minting and people were claiming them for free so he was the biggest claimer of zombies and he was financing the development of art blocks through the sale of some of those punks so a, a pretty cool story claiming then being a mod and onboarding a lot of people to the punks community and then using those zombies to build art blocks it's it's mind-blowing and one question that it's challenging but we like to ask it to a, a, all of our guests is if you can describe Snowfro with one word, what's the first one that comes to mind? Superhero. Let's go to the rapid fire section. Questions are going to be rapid fire. The answers don't need to be. So please, any take your, your time, no, no rush. The first one is, we've mentioned before that Flamingo was, um, it, they coordinated in a Friday night, Saturday morning, to raise $750,000 to buy the Purple Hat Alien. Any grail or any piece that across all the DAOs has gotten away and the story behind it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, we were very interested early on in X copy, um, not surprisingly. And um, I think that one thing with the benefit of hindsight that Uh, I, I imagine most of the members of Flamingo would agree would have just been to collect him, collect his works a little bit harder off of that. We tried, um, we actually tried to commission a work um, before, um, you know, before his career really took off, um, understandably. Um, and I think we kind of joke internally inside Flamingo that he's kind of the one that got away a bit, so... Uh, but his his work's amazing. I think you know, kind of that that uh, aesthetic. I think you're starting to see it in kind of Kim Asendorf's work now, and I just think that's a very powerful aesthetic that uh, only X Copy can really capture. So that's probably one that uh, I put in for for getting away. One a little bit more personal. What pieces are hanging on your walls? They could be NFTs or traditional art. Yeah. So you know, um, I have been a Again, personally, just a huge um, um, believer in William Upon. So I love anti-cyclones. Uh, they really just kind of speak to me. So uh, that's something I, I've, I've spent quite a bit uh, staring at, uh, kind of obsessing over. I think they're, it's a fantastic set. Uh, I'm also a huge Kim Asendorf fan. Uh, I think that his work is absolutely astounding. Uh, so... On the, the gen art side, it, it's definitely those two that, that have taken up most of my mind share recently. What is currently capturing your interest? 
Um, you know, from what's currently capturing my interest is what does this look like in, you know, five years, right? Like, uh, I think that uh, in a classic uh, crypto way, you know, the ecosystem kind of got a little ahead of itself, um, got over its skis, as we, as we say here in the States. Um, and then there's always kind of a reset. Uh, people think that, you know, this kind of movement, this technology just isn't going to uh, fulfill its vision, and then it comes roaring back. Um, it seems pretty predictable at this point. Um, and so I'm really uh, focused on what does that look like? Um, and my gut tells me that it's going to be more dynamic. Uh, we're going to see a lot more public presentations of, of works. Um, we're going to see kind of a move to more com complexity on the art side, um, which I'm, I'm very excited about. Um, I've also just been kind of fascinated uh, with some of the aesthetics that are coming out of um, different LLM and generative systems. I think they're pretty fascinating. I think people looked at them initially and some of the early works were pretty gloomy, uh, but we're seeing like kind of new optimistic aesthetics coming out and I find those pretty fascinating. So I'd say it's kind of uh, those two things that that I'm really just trying to puzzle over. And then I think the uh, kind of the last thing, I do think that like the way people interact with the art and like how it gets collected, uh, how, how people um, are able to participate. Uh, that's all kind of changed uh, or is changing. It kind of changed at the end of the, of the last cycle for this auction model. So I, I would love to see kind of platforms move away from auctions and, and back to kind of more of like a, a fun uh, minting process. I know there's challenges with bots there. So I'm hoping the technologists come up with something clever so that we we can have kind of the, the fun, almost like unboxing moments that, that people liked about um, uh, collecting general art without uh, without having to like sit there for 40 minutes, you know, bidding on an auction or we're getting a refund of some sort. So that's another thing I've been thinking about, mechanics. Though I, I miss those early art blocks gas wars, but they were really fun and the minting your piece and, and seeing it being created was something special for sure yeah there was like a social element to it right it's like you got to go to op open sea maybe you didn't, you didn't get exactly what you like you get to see what else came out and that. and then you get this like shared online experience where you get people talking about it I, I feel like when you move to this auction model just some of that like some of that it's subtle but like some of that feeling just got lost so i'm excited to see kind of how uh, technologists and like and creators just kind of play around with that um, I should also mention, I'm super fascinated with like programmable NFTs, you know, uh, Flamingo um, has collected a, a, a fair number of math castles, but I think like more dynamic, more on-chain type work, uh, I think is super fascinating just to see how people can push the envelope on the tech side. There's some really interesting projects that are coming out of the woodwork now that may not have the attention on them, but I think they're pretty fascinating. I just saw a project yesterday that you could trigger a smart contract transaction. And it uh, it regenerates, it redraws over like a seven day period. So it's like an infinite project with infinite variations all through like on-chain mechanics. It's pretty cool. Super cool. And someone or involved in so many DAOs, you must cross too many opportunities. How do you filter opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I look, I I just try to do stuff that I believe in and I'm interested in and feel like it's well-intentioned. So um, when it comes to stuff like chatting with the uh, folks from the Squiggle community, like I'm all in, right? Um, it's a great group. Um, you know, and I, for me, it just, it, it just pushing things forward in a, in a really nice, productive, responsible uh, way and pushing forward what, what I think is the end point here, which is an, an internet that has collectible, uh, a range of collective art assets and media objects. Uh, I think the entire crypto space has been over obsessed with financial products and services and, and DeFi. And, you know, this is the special part of what digital assets are bringing. They enable people to come together. Uh, they create a race to the top for creators. They reward people for high quality work. Um, they enable people to launch their careers, whether they're in the States or Europe or another part of the globe. Uh, and I think that that's really important. I think there's a lot of, talented people around the planet um, that deserve to get connected together uh, and those talented people uh, if they have that talent should be rewarded for their efforts i think that that's a uh, a nice way to, to build things 
And I think that the art always leads culture. And I think the stuff that we've seen over the past year um, is going to increasingly have a huge impact on culture. And I think, um, I think also some of the mechanics that we're seeing around collecting art is going to just be how all media is collected and consumed in the future. So I think we're just kind of at the beginning of a, of a long thing. And I just look for projects and teams and, uh, and other opportunities that, that kind of align with that vision. How do you define success and has this changed it, 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 over time? I don't really, I don't even spend much time that you're really thinking about success. I, I honestly am just focused on um, what I just described. Like I think people should be doing what they're interested in, what they care about, what they're passionate about, connecting with people that, uh, that they believe, you know, will make, make, uh, make their world a better place. You know, I, I just view myself in many ways, like as a catalyst and, uh, just try to be as helpful as I can. That's something uh, beautiful. I'm, I'm going to use it for, for myself. Like I really love that. And my last question, my last rapid fire question, what motivates you to continue? I'm just interested in this. You know, it's, it's kind of like reading a great book and you just kind of can't get enough. That's the way digital assets have been for me. I, I just think it's a fascinating space. Um, you know, it's great to see kind of some of the, Uh, the bad actors in the space get kind of washed out so that the good folks can remain and, and kind of push this entire ecosystem forward. Um, I think there's kernels of ideas that are really important here uh, and a lot of hard work that needs to be put into it. And, you know, we're, we, like I, um, folks in, on the Tribute Out team, and I, speaking as a member of Flamingo and some of the uh, other, other DAOs, it seems like there's a lot of folks that are willing to dig in and, and try to build build this ecosystem, build this industry in the right way. And so that's super motivating. Um, and I, you know, I think that if I can look back and say that I uh, helped uh, talented artists and creators kind of showcase and highlight their work and are able to uh, hopefully build communities that can make an impact, um, not just on the internet, but more broadly, I think that that's a, that's a good thing to do. So that's what keeps me, keeps me going. Beautiful place to, to end. I don't, as someone that really admires what you have created in Tribute Labs and all the DAOs, it's been a pleasure to have you as a guest. Any closing remarks that you want to share with the community? Well, I just wanted to thank you, Nifty, and thank all the folks in the Squiggle DAO ecosystem. I, you know, I think you've done a remarkable job kind of cohering, being a focal point, adding creativity. Still love the Google skateboards. That was awesome. Uh, so thanks, thanks for all the hard work. You know, as somebody that spends quite a bit of time in DAOs, um, uh, we know all the challenges that you have to face. There's a lot, um, and I think it's important that you guys are doing are doing the work to kind of figure out how to how to push push the generative art space forward, to push the DAO space forward. So thank you and everybody else on the Google DAO side for your uh, your service. We are just really fortunate, as, as you were saying, on, on working on, on someone that is so interesting and we are so passionate about. So we are just fortunate and with such an amazing community. We are just really lucky. Aaron, thank you so much. For those of you in the audience, please follow Aaron on Twitter. Is at A-W-R-I-G-H-0-1. A-W-R-I-G-H-0-1. And you can follow Google Now, join our Discord, has some free sections for members that want to join the community. Feel free to join, ask any questions. We will be happy to, to answer and, and help you onboard you into the, the Google journey. Thanks for listening to the Google Now podcast, which has been brought to you by Niftify. Niftify is the pioneer of the entire NFT lending market. Their platform has the deepest liquidity, which usually means you can get the best terms. They also have no auto liquidation risk. As long as you repay the loan before maturity, you get your asset back. Get more flexibility on your finances, take advantage of any opportunities, and make your NFTs work for you. Niftify has done over $500 million in total loan volume since launching in 2020 and has had over 60,000 loans with zero security incidents. Head to niftify.com and try lending today. The information provided in this podcast is for general informational purposes only. It should not be considered as professional or financial advice. The hosts and guests are not licensed financial advisors, accountants, or lawyers. 
The content is based on personal experiences, opinions, and research, and its accuracy, completeness, and timeliness cannot be guaranteed.